All right. Thank you, everyone. As you heard, my name is Sia Peniza. I come from an organization called Political Economy Southern Africa. Political Economy Southern Africa is a political economy think tank, and we focus on regional integration in SADC and anything related to African development. Um, and we've come into partnership with the Northwest University to arrange this uh, seminar as it is uh, quite critical at this moment, also given the deliberation and the decision made by the ANC, as mentioned uh, by President Cyril Ramaphosa a few days ago. Um, today's discussion, I want to focus on the clash or the challenge of balancing justice with economic development. Uh, but I want to start off with giving quite a clear and um, thoroughly researched historical account of how we found ourselves where we are, as well as ana analyze some of the socioeconomic and developmental impacts of the decision and the direction that we're taking regarding the expropriation of land without compensation and why this is necessary. So just to give you an overview, as mentioned, I'll start off with a brief historical account, uh, then looking at some of the process and challenges uh, that we've had in terms of land restitution in South Africa, and then look at the political economy more broadly around land reform in South Africa and where we're going and what should be done next. But before I start, I would like to observe protocol and uh, thank everyone for uh, you know, spending your time and uh, coming out to hear us today, and I hope that um, you leave here having learned something or at least having improved your opinion or perspective around these issues, uh, given that they are so critical. So I want to start off with an account of looking at uh, the dispossession and the disenfranchisement of land, uh, of, of black people or land from black people in South Africa. Um, obviously, you might know the general narrative that um, first, it was the Portuguese settlers uh, from Europe who were on their way to India, uh, made a stop in the Cape of Good Hope, and soon thereafter, they were joined by uh, the British and other settlers, and obviously had a skirmish uh, with the Dutch and the, between the Dutch and the British, but that's the general narrative. Now I want to focus on the issue of land governance and how we came to be where we are today. So. The dispossession of land is really a policy or an approach um, that settling uh, communities had towards uh, native uh, South Africans. And really what they viewed was how to deal and how to integrate with natives. And this is termed around the issue of the native question. Most people think that it finds its, uh, its grounding in terms of land at least in, a, in the Native Land Act of 1913, but actually there were some previous uh, acts and other legislations that predate uh, this 1913 act. And really the dispossession starts in 1894 uh, with the Glen Grey Act. Glen Grey is an area where we now uh, call Queenstown in the Eastern Cape, and really this was the initial legislation and which was seen as an answer to dealing with the native question. And um, this was seen as a positive step, at least by the colonial settlers, to the extent that Cecil John Rhodes considered this as the Africa Bill, with intention of not just implementing this act in South Africa, but in other British colonies on the continent and throughout the continent. And really what it did was it prohibited uh, black people from acquiring land, hiring, or even um, owning land. And its focus was literally on how to deal with the issue of segregating land, labor, and franchise, and how to separate the franchise and land and labor of um, colonial settlers vis-a-vis -vis the native uh, South Africans. And obviously this was then later uh, cemented uh, with the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1910 after the British, uh, the anglo Boer War ended and uh, South Africa then was unified and uh, this was then followed um, by uh, the enactment of the 1913 Land Act. But before the enactment of the 1913 Land Act, there was a lot of movement, social movement, and this is what led to the formation of the predecessor of the ANC, 
the Southern African Native National Congress. And at the time, it was majorly a middle class movement trying to fight for the rights of black people, um, particularly on the issue of land, but more broadly also around the issue of governing of labor and franchise in South Africa. And then, uh, so the dispossession is happening throughout this period, even historically, and even before the enactment of these, of these laws. But these laws then set in stone the way in which the state and the way in which the law um, dealt with the issue of land ownership and black people in particular, and uh, dispossessing the black people of the land. We later then see, uh, with the victory of the National Party in 1948, in the enactment of the Group Areas Act and the Bantu Authorities Act, um, that uh, the land was then uh, completely dispossessed. You know, this is how suburbia was created. This is how townships were created through these forms of legislation. And also the Bantu Act, which then established the Bantu stands. At the time, they were considered to be labor reserves for cheap labor. So you must have heard about migrant labor, either from Eastern Cape or even some parts of uh, northern provinces going to Gauteng to work in mines. And really, the state at this time, although there was a union of South Africa, the Bantu stands were seen as separate states from South Africa to the extent that you needed a pass as someone coming from the Bantu stands moving into suburban South Africa, uh, which was uh, you know, the Transvaal, um, the, 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 the Cape Colony, and the other four states that were part of the Union of South Africa. And after um, democracy, after 1994, the, the South African government then tried to reconstruct and develop, because at the time, uh, land had been completely dispossessed from black people. Um, and you know the statistics of the, the latest land audit that was published by the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform is, evident, uh, is evidence of this. Uh, some of the numbers that come out of the land audit show that 72% of the land in South Africa is in white hands. Demographically, white people constitute 10 to 12% of the population, and yet they own 72% of the total land in South Africa. African people have ownership of 4% of the land, and colored people at 15, Indians at 5, the rest of the people at 3, and some communal ownership at 1% of the land. So clearly we can see that even as far as last year, when this land audit was published, the ownership of land is vastly skewed. And this should not be a surprise to any of us, because if you count the 100 years from 1894 to 94, this is really the time at which black people were dispossessed and legislatively so. What that means was that uh, you know, it was legal to dispossess and take land from black people. And so it's quite surprising in many instances now when we speak of land, now that land has been commercialized or passed through multiple hands, most people will say, oh, but I bought my land, I own my land. But this is really the historical legacy and where we come from. So the ownership patterns are clear in, uh, are clearly illustrative of what happened during this period. So in the post-apartheid period, we enact um, the Restitution of Land Act along and later on enacted the Constitution of 96. The Constitution of 96 really is what is seen as what undone, what undid you know, the, the, the development process that attempts to reconstruct and develop. Because what that did was it um, it, uh, it, it also legislated the current ownership in 94 and made it uh, legal for people who had dispossessed or had stolen land in many instances to own the land privately in the democratic period. And at the same time, section 25 of the Constitution, um, although speaks to expropriation of land for public use, also required adequate compensation for this land. And this is where really um, the principle, although not constitutionally required, of willing buyer, willing seller comes from. Um, the constitution itself does allow for expropriation without compensation for public benefit, uh, but at the same time, the specific section 25, which speaks to expropriation broadly, requires adequate compensation. And now it's up to anybody to consider what you think is adequate compensation. I doubt that anybody would disagree with the notion that dispossessed land should not be compensated if it is going to be restituted to the owner. Uh, 
A simple example you might have heard or like to make is if you lose your cell phone through theft and find a way to get your cell phone back, you're not expected to pay for your cell phone again. And really the absurdity also of balancing justice and economic development extends to the current usage of the land. So if you can imagine yourself as being a victim of a hijacking and later maybe after 10, 20 years of trying to find a legal process to reclaim your car back, you are confronted with the fact that the current owner who stole the car from you is using it for business purposes. And now you have to compensate them uh, for the loss of income. You have to compensate them for whatever investment that they might have had in your vehicle before receiving this. And I think this is totally absurd. Um, at least the Constitution should define the circumstances where it is necessary to compensate people and where it is not. And really, this is what the expropriation without compensation is about. Most people fear that it is really about taking land from everybody, but if you have stolen that land, you have got no right over that land. However, if you've got clear proof of private ownership with the records and handing down the land through multiple owners, I think you do have a case to get compensated for that land. But the vast majority of the land in South Africa was not acquired through market means, although it was legal. So some people might say, but since it was legal then, there was no wrongdoing on the part of white South Africans or you know, the pro-apartheid uh, South Africans at the time. But you know, there have been multiple instances of this, and the mere fact that the United Nations has declared apartheid as a crime against humanity should show that we should be treating it the same as the precedent set by the Nuremberg trials, which although it was legal for, Jewish peop for German people to persecute and kill Jewish people, the Nuremberg trial was a persecution of those people who were acting legally in the instance of uh, the Jewish uh, Holocaust, but still needed to account to, because it was a, a crime against humanity, quite clearly so. So through this process of uh, land restitution has been very slow. Slow just because of the adjudication process of this land uh, takes from 10 years and upwards to about 20 years. Um, and also slow because it's been quite costly. And because of the principle that developed, willing buyer, willing seller, people were not actually obliged to return back the entirety of pockets of land. So they could choose, right? And obviously the rational decision is to get rid of land that is either not productive or that is less productive than the majority of the land that you own currently. And what we've seen is that through this process of restitution, uh, the people who have now been recipients of the land again have been, have been set up to fail, either because they didn't get inadequate support post-restitution or because the land they acquired was unproductive. And so the real process of land reform through this uh, process of land restitution, through these acts, has been largely incomplete. And this is what really creates the impetus for political movements such as the economic freedom fighters, uh, because of the realization that despite the political liberation of 1994, by and large, South Africans are still not economically liberated. And so the struggle currently is to liberate black people economically. But through this process, there are some sort of myths or redirections um, that are trying to not perhaps curb, but to redirect the process or slow the process. You might have heard recently uh, from the Khoisan uh, advocacy group um, mentioning that before we even talk of uh, expropriation of land without compensation, they need to be uh, acknowledged as the predecessors of, or predecessor and owner of the land in South Africa. But I think this is either uh, based on a false understanding or eugenics understanding of the history of South Africa, um, but also this is typically a tactic that apartheid used to create a buffer between the black majority and the white minority. And this was created through Indians and Coloreds who were used as tools in the, in the struggle, um, given specific kind of preferential rights to create a buffer uh, between them. So the idea is that there would be no uprising uh, from black people against white people um, the first uprising would be from black people to colored people to Indian people. And this is part of the big fight that happened uh, around the 50s. Uh, 
And so today, when we hear politicians speak about the so-called racism of Indian people, this is the historical foundation of this. And the, the forced um, cooperation amongst blacks and Indians in the 50s um, is what has, has you know, highlighted the fact that some racial groups, non-black, have been used as a sort of buffer uh, between the majority. So really, the idea here is that um, Khoisan people are now claiming that uh, the distinction or category of being colored is incorrectly placed upon them, and that they are actually Khoisan and, pre and uh, their predecessors of even black Bantu people who are in South Africa. But I think that this is, this, this, is mis, this is misinformed because there's an incongruency between the scientific historical account and the sociological historical account. Scientific historical account will tell you stories of the cradle of humankind where there was a skull of Miss Bliss and perhaps Naledi more recently, um, which shows that the origin of mankind globally is within Africa and indeed in Southern Africa. So, I'm not certain where, for example, the account that black people arrived in South Africa after the Khoisan is based on, if not based on sociological accounts of Dutri. Uh, there's a sociologist who was uh, researching Bantu languages, um, posted in uh, <coughs> what is now the DRC, back then Zaire. He was studying Lingala and tried to track the traces of Bantu languages and categorize them. And really the story of Bantu South Africans coming from the Congo Delta region is originates from this, but then this doesn't sit um, this doesn't sit consistently with the scientific account that says that human or mankind originates from Southern Africa. And on the other hand, there's a biological account that says that uh, the DNA of um, Khoisan people is slightly different from that of Bantu people and that they have a DNA that originates to prehistoric man. And I think that this is either false, clearly false, as we know, the whole study and history of eugenics, um, you know, which is a, 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 a body of work which was used to justify uh, divide and conquer rules uh, and tactics throughout the colonial history. If you think of the history of Rwanda, uh, the Hutus and Tutsis were speaking the same language Yet through eugenics and certain characteristics were identified which differentiated these people leading up to the massacre of 1994. Similarly, my view is that the Khoisan really are victims of eugenics or there's just misinformed in terms of the history of South Africa. So, but in any case, the issue of land expropriation is not necessarily about uh, which races to benefit, etc. Clearly though, the the unbalanced ownership pattern in South Africa needs to be corrected because this speaks to poverty levels, this speaks to um, you know, people not being able to get themselves out of the cycle of poverty. And really the process that the state is trying to take with the land expropriation bill would benefit everyone. So I think that this whole narrative of so -called, the so-called better of groups trying to advocate for themselves or being the predecessors of the land is just noise. So going back to the slow process of restitution, so why has it been slow? So as mentioned, there's a high cost of compensation. I'll go through an example of one of the best case scenarios of land restitution, where four and a half thousand hectares were restituted for the value of around 40 million rand. Um, clearly this is not market-based, and the other problems around this was the slow pace of adjudication. And as well as mentioned, the setting up for failure. But I think by and large, the process of restitution has been slow because it is focused primarily on rural land or peri-urban land. And really, this leaves open wide the question of places where people were you know, quite clearly dispossessed of the land and there's still accounts clearly to this day that speak of places like Sophia Town, District 6, which are all urban areas. But obviously the challenge of that is that this land has been commercialized and is now contributing to the economic development or currently where we are um, in terms of economic development. But we need to resolve the issue of urban land if we are to speak about thorough land reform. Because as a result of the spatial legacies of apartheid, you still find black South Africans spending upwards of two-thirds of their income solely on transport simply because townships 
and the settlements where black people live are just extremely far away from where they find work. So unless we're able to resolve the issue of urban land and finding a way to restitute urban land or creating an equitable space, because at this point we're not even talking about land redistribution. We are simply speaking about <coughs> land restitution, restoring land that was stolen. We also need to talk about the land distribution uh, that we need to take in order to create an equal opportunity platform. You still find to this day political parties that talk about equal opportunities for all, but would be very much averse to dealing with the urban land question um, as if this is not part of the unequal setting that we find ourselves as a result of the apartheid legacy. So now I want to look at a case of successful land restitution. There is a farm out in Tsobosha, uh, in the province, not far, I think about 40, 60 k's from here, um, where there's a Kokwana farming enterprise, which is a business arm of the Depal Communal Property Association. So after 18 years of being part of the restitution process, trying to find a legal solution to the claim for the land, they were eventually awarded the land in 2013. And as mentioned, this was 4,500 hectares restituted for the value of 40 million uh, rand. However, um, the, these farmers are now trying to establish an operation that will take care of the 40 to 60 members of the Communal Property Association who are claimants and beneficiaries of this land. And this is done through the Kokwana Farming Enterprise, which is supposed to be an income generating enterprise that will create benefits and make the land productive for the beneficiaries. But they are faced with multiple challenges. They're faced with the challenges of affording capital equipment uh, and access to markets primarily. So despite being handed over the land, they still have a problem that they still just couldn't afford the equipment to run the farm. And when they did get a grant of about $8 million from government, they still faced the challenge that they had to rely on the previous owners uh, providing either uh, skills transfer or providing information on how to run and operate the land. But at the same time, they find themselves in a challenge that they don't have the social capital in many instances to access markets. So the approach that the government has taken in terms of restituting rural land trying to increase agricultural production is insufficient without post-restitution support. And this includes importance of skills transfer, this includes importance of trying to find equitable ways to give capital equipment, but also giving access to markets. They are trying now uh, with setting up of agri-parks, but that also has its own limitations. So, yeah, so this is where we are in terms of land restitution. So. With all of this, the slow process of land restitution, the setting up for failure in the cases of the most successful cases, this has pushed the government to a point of realizing that without amending the constitution such that we can expropriate land without compensation, at least in specific circumstances, we're never going to deal with the problem of inequality. We're never going to deal with the problem of poverty. We're never going to give black people an adequate and respectable place in the society and re-enfranchise them. And so this is the overall political economy of land reform in South Africa. And at the end of the day, we ultimately face a balancing act or trade-off between providing justice and ensuring economic prosperity. One of the key reasons why South Africa is growing at 0.6%, 0%, uh, and has not really reached the levels of growth that we had maps in the mid-2000s is primarily because we have high unemployment, high poverty rates. We're sitting at about 39% in terms of narrow definition of unemployment. If you consider people who have given up on finding jobs, this number goes up uh, as far as 40%. And the majority of these people who suffer from unemployment are black people. And what this means is that we're sitting with an economy that is relying on about 50 to 60% of its labor force for productivity. So it is no wonder then that we aren't growing at any level of, our, of our, uh, what is considered the potential growth rate of South Africa. On the other hand, there's the issue of capital accumulation. As mentioned, there is a clearly skewed um, uh, distribution in terms of land ownership. If a 
population demography of 10 to 12 percent of the population own 74 percent of the land. That is also mirrored in terms of only ownership of capital or finance. And that means that township economies are left to dilapidate. Uh, people can't find jobs because they either can't afford to transport themselves to urban areas where they need to find jobs. There was a statistic uh, a few years ago uh, that found about 35 to 40 percent of metro rail users in the Western Cape are illegal uh, passengers. What this means is that they're either staff riding or getting off in between stations as a mere act of trying to get to Cape Town to get jobs or to get some sort of prosperity. So really, by rearranging the ownership patterns, we are rearranging the livelihoods and creating a base for accumulation and the ability of black people to take themselves out of poverty. And by amending the constitution to allow for expropriation without compensation, we are delivering justice. And we cannot speak about economic development without delivering justice because it is the injustices of the past that has led us to where we are and have created a structural challenge that hasn't allowed black people to take themselves out of poverty. More importantly, by amending the constitution, we are creating policy certainty. Most people fear that the amendment of the constitution will result in investors moving away or taking away their money. Ultimately, investors aren't necessarily taking a moral stand on South Africa. Uh, the investors are really just interested on policy certainty, ensuring that we're not going to have an amendment of a constitution every year, or that the government won't have a nilly nilly ability to expropriate land uh, that they've invested in. But also the other important thing that they look at is uh, returns on investment. If anybody feels that this is not true or that investors would be much more interested in excuse me, how this process turns out more than they're interested in policy certainty, etc. There are multiple examples on the continent that show um, conflict-ridden countries like the DRC that are still continuing as business as usual. Um, even you know, worse situations uh, and more unstable socioeconomic situations where investors are still engaging simply because the returns are there and the policy certainty is there. So through the process of the constitutional amendment, we will be able to provide the policy certainty that will quell investors' fears. And so what needs to take place is that the process needs to be unhindered, and at the same time, the government needs to be clear in defining what are the circumstances where it is okay to expropriate without compensation, and where are the circumstances where we will promote or at least protect private property rights of people. I think that's the all of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. for setting the scene on the discussions that we are going to have. I like the presentation specifically because you, you are able to actually provide the technicalities of the political economy of land reform in South Africa. The next speaker uh, is uh, Mr. Ongokami Moreni, who will be presenting on the challenges and realities surrounding the fast tracking of land restitution in South Africa. I think uh, Moreni would actually also provide all the nitty gritties because he has worked as a research. Uh, in the Claims Commission and the institution that was dealing with the uh, traditional leadership disputes in the Northwest, as I give the podium to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Uh, let me take this opportunity to create the management of the institution the senior traditional leaders that are present here, our uh, clergy, the student community in general. Uh, I must confess, uh, the facilitator, that the previous speaker, uh, if I had prepared a presentation, because I just 
prepared speaking notes. Our donors suspect that he had access to my presentation. <laughs> uh, I, I must say that most of the issues that the previous speaker spoke to are the issues that I'll reflect on. I heard that you are very jealous of your time, so I'll not waste time on some of the facts and details that he has already articulated on. Uh, I will just attempt to reflect on some of uh, the issues I believe you do not uh, uh, engage on. But generally, by and large, I think that I welcome the presentation and I agree fully with the content of it. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite progressive and uh, refreshing. Uh, colleagues, my, my task is very simple is to actually highlight the challenges and progress that is registered through the land restitution process. The historical basis of it, I think that the previous speaker gave a proper narrative and to what led to the democratic dispensation to resolve that there is a dire need for us to attempt to undo and uh, us to attempt to advantage those who have previously disadvantaged and disenfranchised. Part of the thorny issue and part of the sensitive matter that I think that all role players and all stakeholders that are engaging in this important discussion is to deal decisively and give a clear definition in terms of what needs to be done uh, around firstly the issue of communal land. I think that we, we, we've had discussions, we've had discussions rather, uh, uh, more specifically relating to the issue of the Nguanyama Trust in KZN. We need to have a historical account that how did it come into being that our senior traditional leaders, our traditional institutions also have the authority or the necessary power to govern over certain uh, pieces of land. I think that is also important. Uh, something that I think that uh, uh, our traditional leaders are not really comfortable with. But second to that, colleagues, the 1913 Land Act, as the previous speaker has indicated, was not only the basis of all the challenges that we are currently. Ordinarily and generally people who would ask that, but after having expropriated land, after having allocated land to those that were dispossessed or those that the land were intended for, how does it address the challenges that the county is currently grappling with? But the reality of the matter is that the challenges that the county is currently grappling with, it's on the basis and the genesis of these challenges emanate from the disposition of land. Amongst other things, what the, the previous regimes, both the colonization and apartheid regime, achieved systematically was to ensure that the minority and the privileged that they were serving were not only empowered in terms of the land. The speaker was, was saying that the current redistribution of land or the current provisions that are there they are setting up the current owners of some of these lands for failure. I would want to agree with him. Because in the past, you would not only get the land, but you would get the necessary technical know-how, you would get the necessary financial support to ensure that that land becomes productive. The government then, the then government would, amongst other things, give the white owners of the land low, uh, low, rate, interest, low, low, low rate loans and other technical skills to make sure that the land becomes productive. The current case is that you get the land back, but there's no technical skills, there's no necessary financial masses that is sufficient to enable you to use that land as productive as you should. Now, we, we are asking ourselves what are the challenges currently that are confronting the land restitution and why we have not progressed as much as we should at this point in time. Lot and lot of billions have been spent on this program. 
but the government has not been able to reach the target that they set itself. Because amongst other things, what serves as hurdles, what serves as impediments to the program? Uh, the speaker, the previous speaker mentioned one of the things, the exorbitant and ridiculous prices or market, if not even market related value that would be attached to some of this land. The second challenge to that, which is a challenge that we should attribute to ourselves, you would have differences among those who would be provided with that particular land, which then contributes and serves as an impediment to ensure that the land becomes productive. Thirdly, one of the challenges also that serves as an impediment to the program is that there is no clear program, in my view, that is set up by government once we have given you the land. This is the expectation that we, we, we would want to get. For, these are the expectations that we have for you. Now, we need to have that in place. The statistics that were, were given by the previous speaker are correct and alarming. These are the statistics that I think that all of us should be worried about and ensure that we need to change those particular statistics. And government must play an instrumental and important role in that regard. Because the statistics for them to be as they are, the previous apartheid government uh, uh, played a major role in that particular ownership pattern that we are currently in, in this particular country. I normally say to, to people, the land question should not make it a racial issue. It's becoming an emotive issue in South Africa unnecessarily. The, the facts need to be presented as they are, so that everybody who is affected by this particular question must be able to understand the, necess the necessity of reforming and transforming the current ownership pattern that we have in South Africa. That is the breeding ground, a fertile breeding ground for the challenges that the country is grappling with of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. Therefore, land is an important instrument to ensure that the challenges that are espoused by the National Development Plan are dealt with. by Tuti Barulawal and Fano, senior managers, members of the media who are here, all the participants, Saka Karlit Sotiali, do make this. Kito le kahore ki sobolo kanyan presentishi na kaso de ekisi skaka siyala. The message was very loud and clear. If you look at another program director, we are going to expropriate the mic. I'm not sure whether there was a warning for it now. I'm going to be treated differently. However, I'm yet to observe whether I'll be treated differently. Uh, but I'm going to like to my presentation. I represent an organization called the Vumelana Advisory Fund, which is a non profit. Uh, public benefit organization which has been around for some time. Uh, Merco organized to assist beneficiaries of land reform to develop their land. We do that through funding transaction advisory services in order to create much needed jobs, um, etc. We are actually a legacy project of the SYL Business Trust. For those of you who know the Business Trust during the advent of democracy, Big business and government forged by the Bakopana and created what we call the business trust in order to focus on some big projects to assist the new government. So the business trust was always meant to be a finite project. When the business trust closed down, then Vumelana was formed based on some of the work that we did in, in uh, the Bushback Ridge area where we mobilized private investments in excess of two billion rents. As an organization, we've already supported a number of programs. We've in, in, mobilized uh, in private investments in the land reform projects in excess of two billion rents uh, just over the last five years or so. So that's really our focus. We can talk about that, but that's not really my focus of the focus of my presentation. Um, 
I'm going to talk briefly on land reform and the basic questions that are unresolved. Challenges in the land reform, some of them have already been alluded to by previous speakers. How do we support partnerships? A little bit on what we do from our side. Debates on expropriation of land without compensation. Um, this is a hot topic, as we all know, that sometimes it, the emotions it just go high. But I think it is important that we must really become, because this is really an important issue for us as South Africans. This is not an issue that we must just, you know, fudge and, 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 and hope that we resolve it. Possible social economic consequences, if it's not properly handled, and then I will conclude. Um, the issue of land reform is not, it's nothing new, really, in South Africa. It's something that's been happening throughout the world and across many, many years. It's really intended to change patterns of ownership and use to those that are socially acceptable. In South Africa, the land reform program really started in 1994. It started off as a rights-based program, really intended to address the legacy of the past. And in terms of the target, it was targeted to transfer about 30% of commercial agricultural land to our people. Just on this point, I, I just need to highlight the fact that more often when we talk about land reform, we tend to focus on agriculture. We tend to lose sight of the fact that there are other areas of our economy which are impacted upon. For example, we tend to deal with large tracts of land which are really for ecotourism and conservation. So, so, so it is important to remember that we are not just talking about agriculture, but we are talking about other, other, other areas involved. It consists of three components, as already been in, uh, uh, highlighted. There's restitution, redistribution, and tenor reform. I know that sometimes redistribution and restitution is often used interchangeably, but these are the three legs of, 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 of land reform with the last one, tenor reform, which is really the least developed. I think there's one specific area where as South Africans we really not spend a lot of time on. Um, I just thought with this slide on the basic and resolved questions, that the point that I'm really trying to, to highlight here is a lot of times when we talk about land reform, we do not always agree on what we are trying to achieve, what is it that we are talking about, what should land reform actually achieve, how it should address some of the challenges, how do we measure it. People throw all sorts of numbers around, uh, which numbers we should be using, etc. If we're talking about success, if we say we've been successful, how do we measure that success? And what is that success? Uh, so those are the questions. What is it that we are trying to do? Are we, are we just trying to change the patterns of land reform? Are we just trying to restore rights? Are we trying to improve livelihoods? Are we trying to promote small-scale farmers? Are we trying to de-racialize de commercial, commercial agriculture? Uh, and one could say all of the above, but what, what is the priority? You know, we need, those are the kind of issues that we need to address. We can't be all over, all over the show. We need to say these are the key areas that we want to focus on as a starting point if we are to make any dent to the challenges that we've got in the land reform space. With regard to priority, are we going to be focusing on China reform where I've said there's been little progress, restitution for those who, prove, who, who have been uh, dispossessed in the past, um, we, we also know that with restitution and, uh, for, I mean, those who might have had or uh, look at some of the reports we've seen from the from the, from the department, interestingly, majority of the claimants in the restitution space opted for financial compensation. Uh, uh, what are we saying? I, I, I'm still aware that uh, many, many communities out there who claim land, they are saying we don't need this land, we want uh, financial compensation. What are we saying? Perhaps we also need to educate our people before we actually decide for them what's good for them. And maybe we need to listen more than actually telling people what is it that they should do. Redistribution. I think this is one part which has had a major share of the funds in government, but the question is, is, it, is this a priority? And what are the challenges? How should we, how should we deal with that? 
and also to say if, if, if we are talking about all of this, what should be the social relationships and economic structure? Are we looking at what mix? Is, is it a mix of group-based ownership or, and production, subdivided into small family farms? Or what are we talking about? Are we looking at maintaining large-scale farms? Or what really are we talking about? So these are the, all the questions that are lying around that we haven't literally addressed whilst we're talking about these issues that are impacting on, on, on us. And in terms of acquisitions, also there are many questions there. State acquisitions, there's the market. The reality is no one has actually really dug to understand how much land has been purchased privately. If you try to get those statistics, you will never get a, a correct information. No one has got that. Land development, should this be state managed? Is the state the appropriate entity to really run this based on past experience? Or should this be market driven, for example? Post settlement support, what are we saying? Is there a role for the private sector? What about the non profit sector, etc.? And maybe let me just go to the next slide. Uh, and I know that uh, here I'm already talking to the court better. The primary reason why I had this slide was just so that one could really emphasize the magnitude of the problem, and this has already been indicated by the previous speakers. The reality is the transfer of land has proceeded too slowly to satisfy post-liberation aspirations of the majority of, of South Africans. Land that has been transferred is unproductive. In 2010, it was, this is the information that came from the then Minister of uh, Rural Development and Land Reform. This is not what I'm saying. He's on record saying 90% of the 5.9 million hectares that had been transferred then was no longer economically active. Is this something that should worry us? And just to pause for a moment, 5.9 million hectares is one and a half times the size of Switzerland. That's how big, that's the magnitude, the scale of the problem. Now, obviously this has increased in 2012 there were estimations that the failure rate was around 70% in 20. Lately, we know that there's more than 8 million hectares that has already been transferred. And there's, there's a difference that there's between 70 or 80% failure rate. But the fact of the matter is the large tracts of land that have been transferred are, are not, no longer economically active. And this has resulted in many people actually losing their jobs. So these are some of the things that we should be worried about. Uh, I mean, as I've said, through the process of colonialism and, apart and apartheid, communities not only lost their land, they, lo they lost access to capital, skills, market networks, and entrepreneurship. And the restoration of land without access to capital and skills leave communities with what the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto would call dead capital, because you just have these assets which are not really working for you because you don't have the means to really work the land. Those are the issues that we should be worried about. And from wh where we are coming from as an organization, we are saying forging partnerships with third parties who've got the resources is the most immediate way to address some of these challenges. We are not saying this is the only way to address the challenges. We are saying it's the most immediate way to address the challenges while we deal with all the other issues. This partnership however, must respond to the asymmetry of power relations and the differing ability of the partners to both carry the risk and absorb the cost. I'm not going to spend much time on this. this I, I think for those of you who might be interested in getting to know what this is all about, I can give you more information. However, this busy slide is really an attempt in one slide to just indicate to you how we operate as an organization. Generally, we would get approached by a community who say you've got land, et cetera, and then we'll enter into an, an MOU with them to assist them. And then we have a panel of expert transaction advisors whom we will appoint who would then assist the communities to mobilize private investment. Good afternoon. I know it's two minutes before afternoon, but I insist that it's afternoon. I'm rounding off to the nearest hour. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I know I'm, re I'm rearranging a lot of things. I'm quite short. I'm vertically challenged. Um, it's quite dangerous to present an hour before lunchtime because you have to compete with the food, and the food is being organized next door. So 
I'll really try and stick to, to the 10 or 20 minutes that I'm given. There are three things that I wish to achieve um, after this presentation. One is to illustrate the justification for expropriation. Two, to establish that colonialism and its effects cannot be divorced from the current debate on expropriation. Three, that there are flaws in section 25 of the Constitution, but that there is room for litigation. And I think generally, I'm hoping that after my presentation, when I say zero rent compensation is still compensation, the House will agree with me, right? Yes. All right. Allow me to begin with the African Charter, as adopted at the Congress of the People in Clip Town on 26 June 1955. It asserts that restrictions of land ownership on a racial basis shall be ended and all land redivided amongst the people who work it in order to banish famine and land hunger. In the preamble of the Organization of the African Union Charter adopted in 1963, African leaders affirmed their consciousness to the fact that freedom, equality, justice, and dignity are essential objectives for the achievement of the legitimate aspirations of the African people. We should note that this charter was drafted against the backdrop of colonialism. Linked to this understanding was an acknowledgement that there was a responsibility to harness the natural resources of the continent for the total advancement of the African people. Article 14 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, as adopted in 1981 by the Organization of African Unity, which we now know as the African Union, provides that the right to property shall be guaranteed and that it may only be encroached upon in the interest of public need or in the general interest of the community in accordance with the provisions of appropriate laws. Article 21 of the same charter goes further to provide that in the, in the case of spoliation, the dispossessed people shall have the right to the lawful recovery of, to the, to the lawful recovery of its property as well as to adequate compensation. Having highlighted some of the international instruments that would find relevance in this debate, it is important that I illustrate how these provisions have been used to settle land-related questions. In Kenya, for instance, in the case of Minority Rights Development and Others versus Kenya, a case decided by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in 2009, the African Commission was of the view that the Endores culture, Endores being a, a, a cultural group that exists in Kenya, the Endorist culture, religion, and traditional way of life were intimately intertwined with their ancestral lands. It agreed that Lake Bogoria and a certain rainforest were central to their way of life, and without access to their ancestral land, the Endorists were unable to fully exercise their cultural rights, religious rights, and felt disconnected from their land and ancestors. The African Commission recommended, amongst others, that the government of Kenya, one, recognize the rights of ownership of the Endores and restitute Endores ancestral land. Two, ensure that the Endores community has unrestricted access to Lake Bogoria and surrounding sites for religious and cultural rights and for the grazing of their cattle. And finally, pay adequate compensation to the community for all the loss suffered. Another example not so far from where we are not so far from where we are today is the Ramat Nabama border post leading into Botswana. There is a jurisprudence that we can tap into right across the border. In January 2002, the government of Botswana terminated water, food, and health services to the Bushmen residing in the central Kalahari Game Reserve in Botswana. Access to the reserve was, was restricted for those who relocated, resulting in some of the Kalahari Bushmen no longer being able to enter the land they had occupied or to pursue their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. The High Court in Botswana concluded that the actions by the government were one, unconstitutional, and subsequently ordered them to pay damages for those, for those of the applicants who have, due to a passage of time, made homes outside the central Kalahari Game Reserve and uh, have now settled to those homes instead of returning back to the game reserve. The court also noted that as a consequence of the relocations, the court also noted that consequence of the relocations was to deprive the applicants of possession of their land possibly, <coughs> wrongly, and without their consent. According to representatives of government, the aims of this relocation were to bring positive um, developments towards the Basara. 
The aims of the relocation were positive in that they wanted to bring the Basara to a developed world away from the underdeveloped cultural practices. In fact, during one of the court proceedings, one of the applicants gave evidence that she did not want to relocate because she wished to be near the graves of her ancestors. Counsel for the respondent burst out laughing, but the court did not join him in his laughter. Ladies and gentlemen, the two cases above are unique in their own occurrences and jurisdictions, one in Kenya, another one in Botswana. One decided by the African Commission and another decided by a high court in Botswana. The merits of each case are not directly applicable to South Africa, <coughs> to the South African situation, but there are two principles that I wish to extract from these cases. One is that dispossession of land from indigenous people, whether facilitated by laws or force, was found unconstitutional <coughs> in both cases. Further, restitution and compensation are both remedies that the courts have entertained in both cases and obviously to the benefit of the indigenous people. And if we substitute the parties hypothetically, the indigenous people in this instance in South Africa would be the black African people that have been dispossessed, moved around by various legislation and various policies of the apartheid government. The second principle that I wish to extract is that in both cases, the cultural rights of the indigenous people had been affirmed and protected by the courts. Culture, identity, and religious practices that are connected to the land do not need to weigh loss, do not need to weigh less than other socio-economic rights, which has been the argument in the theme around South Africa. We have always pegged um, land against the economy, and we do not realize that the cultural rights of people still matter as much as the economy of the country. There are two unfortunate realities that South Africa finds itself in contrast to Botswana and Kenya. At the time when Botswana and Kenya took the decisions to, to dispossess the indigenous people of their land, they had already gained their independence, that's one. They, had already, they already had strong independent judiciaries that owed their allegiance to the constitutions and not other arms of government. The difference is that land dispossession in South Africa occurred long before the enactment of the Native Land Act of 1913, as all the other speakers have, allu have alluded to. In an era where the judiciary, executive, and the legislature spoke one ideology of racial segregation, the possibility of successfully contesting the legality of these acts, and I'm referring to the Native, La to the Native Land Act and any other piece of legislation that empowered the apartheid government to dispossess black Africans of their land, you wouldn't have been able to contest that in a court of law. Courts existed, but there was no rule of law in South Africa at the time. Some historians estimate the period of systematic dispossession to span between the 1600s and, 18, and 1990s. Once again, it would have been impossible for an African to succeed in a claim that their cultural rights have been infringed upon as a result of land dispossession. Since we now have entered a new constitutional dispensation with the new constitution that we have, one may pose an inquiry. When South Africa ushered in a new constitution, did the cultural rights and identities that are linked to ancestral, to ancestral land remain suffocated in the old legal dispensation? I do not think this is the case. There is still room in our constitutional framework for people to assert that their cultural rights and identities are, in, are intricately linked to the land and that the government, the judiciary, and the legislature should engage in proper programs of action to restore the land to the people. And when I look at all the constitutional court cases, and I'll mention one constitutional court case and one Supreme Court of Appeal case, the issue of cultural, li the issue of cultural rights and identity and religious practices and ancestral land has never really featured strongly in our jurisprudence in South Africa. Everyone keeps going to the court to try and contest what is adequate compensation, and we are forgetting that such a thing as cultural rights actually exists in our constitution. Having dealt with the above case law and argument, allow me, to, allow me to direct my attention to our understanding of justice. It was a Greek philosopher, Aristotle, and I know the students who are present today have gone through this with them. Aristotle, who distinguished between corrective justice and distributive justice. Corrective justice provides for the rectification of wrongs committed by one individual that causes harm to another. <coughs> 
Each individual who is harmed by a moral wrong committed by another has a right to rectification, regardless of distributive merit. In light of this definition, there are two questions that South Africa needs to answer, and I suspect the response to both questions will be in the positive. The first question, was colonialism and apartheid harmful? Yes? No? Yes, 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 yes. The second question, are the socio-economic inequalities that exist today in relation to patterns of land ownership, could these patterns of land ownership be attributed to the legacy of colonialism or apartheid? Yes, 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 yes. So I was correct. Both questions can be answered in the affirmative. Despite having answered the two questions in the positive, we should also acknowledge the, the imperfection of some of our civil laws. It makes no difference whether a decent man has been defrauded by a bad man or vice versa, or whether it has been a decent man who has committed adultery. You still have committed adultery. The only difference the law considers is that what brought about the damage. It treats the parties as equals, asks only whether one has done and the other has suffered wrong, and, what, and whether one has done and the other suffered damage. That is a flaw in our civil laws. For example, a claim of distributive justice does not provide a defense against trespassing. Do we understand that? If you are caught trespassing on land that you feel strongly that the person that acquired that land did not acquire it lawfully, it does not mean you will not be found guilty of trespassing. You are still found guilty of trespassing, regardless of <laughs> I wouldn't argue that it's your own place at the time. It, it would be immaterial to the court in, in that particular instance. Because there is a flaw in our civil system, it simply looks at who has a stronger title at the time to the land, and it determines who was not supposed to be on that land at that particular juncture. And that is why you will still be found guilty of um, trespassing, despite the dispossession and the history that we have in South Africa. And that is a flaw that we have in our system. We should then turn our attention to the current constitutional framework in South Africa. One, section 9.2 provides that equality includes the full enjoyment of all rights and freedoms, and that to promote the achievement of equality, legislative and other measures designed to promote, to promote, to protect advanced persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination may be taken. Now, this is a clause that everybody knows in South Africa. There is no provision in this section that limits the interpretation of Section 9 to employment matters. And we have pushed hard, hard as civil society, government, and the private sector, you know, in relation to black empowerment policies and everything. Now, Section 9 did not say we are only going to limit our interpretation of fixing the injustices of the past to the employment sector or procurement. That applies to so many other socioeconomic aspects and I have not seen its application strongly come out when it comes to addressing questions of land and the Constitution. Um, it is therefore possible that with a bit of constitutional creativity, justification for a constructive land redistribution program may be embarked on. In fact, such, such programs have been run before but have not succeeded for various reasons and some of our speakers, some of our latest speakers have illustrated why these programs have failed. The crux of today, Section 25.1, provides that no one may be deprived of property except in terms of law of general application, and no law may permit arbitrary deprivation of property. I would like to read that section again, and I would like you, as I read it, to compare it against other rights in the Constitution. Could someone give me one right in the Constitution that exists randomly? Going once. So it says we all have the right to life, right? And we all have the right to life. Now that is framed in a positive way. It doesn't say you will not be arbitrarily deprived of your right to life. It says you have the right to life. You are given that right. But if you look at section 25.1, it starts from the negative sense. It says um, no one may be, may be deprived of property except in terms of law of general application, blah, 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 blah. From the onset, we should acknowledge that this provision was not crafted to afford everyone the right to property. 
because if it was crafted to afford everyone the right to property, it would have been, it would read similarly to other rights in the Constitution. It was crafted to protect the possession to those who held property at the time of drafting the Constitution. Because when you go for a constitutional negotiation and you already have property, there is no need for you to say everyone has the right to property. What you're going in that negotiation to do is to protect what you currently have. And that is why Section 25 reads the way it does. In essence, Section 25 only applies to, Section 25.1 only applies to those who own land. If you don't own land, don't think Section 25.1 applies to you. You don't qualify. <laughs> Those who do not own land are catered for under section 25.2 and section 25 subsection 3, which provide for expropriation. That's where we belong, those of us who do not own land. The expropriation mentioned under section 25.2 to 3 is qualified in the sense that compensation is required. However, there are factors that need to be considered when determining the amount of compensation that is required. These include one, the current use of the property, the history, of the acquisition and the current use of the property, the market value of the property, blah, blah, blah. And what I've seen in all cases that have gone to the High Court, Supreme Court, or Constitutional Court, the major issue that is contested is the subsection that says the market value of the property. That is what people go and fight for. That is what people concentrate on when they are trying to determine expropriation and what is adequate compensation. There are two assumptions that I wish to dismiss, that I wish to dismiss. One, it has been said that the principle of willing buyer, willing seller is constitutionally entrenched in the sense that the state can only acquire land from a person who is willing to sell it. Second, it is suggested that the constitution protects an expropriated owner's right to compensation to the extent that the owner is, in substance, entitled to the market value of his land on expropriation. I argue that it is perfectly possible that on a given set of facts, just and equitable as required by the Constitution, just and equitable compensation may, significant, may significantly be below market value or as little as 10 rands. The state would be perfectly justified in offering well below market value to a large company that holds, that holds large pieces of unused land on a speculative basis where that land is urgently needed for housing the poor and the state is not in a position to pay the full market value of the land. I had the opportunity to study the, the U.S. and the Nava versus Caesar case that was decided by the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2017, as well as the Dudoit versus Minister of Transport case decided by the Constitutional Court in 2005. In both decisions, the courts debated the calculation of market value of land that was, expropriate, that was being expropriated. But in my humble opinion, they did not clarify enough how the history of acquisition of land impacts on the compensation due. Um, Chair, how many minutes do I have left? Two minutes, thank you very much. I would like to quote directly from the Constitution because you know, we have a lot, a lot of lawyers on Facebook, so you know, sometimes it helps to just go back to the Constitution and really assess whether what is being said is true or false. If you look at section 25.3, I'm going to read it in verbatim. It says, the amount of compensation and the time and manner of payment must be just and equitable, reflecting an equitable balance between public interests and the interests of those affected, having regard to all relevant circumstances, including then the Constitution lists, lists five factors that should be considered when determining compensation. One, the current use of the property. Two, the history of the acquisition and use of the property. Three, the market value of the property. D, the extent of direct state investment, blah, blah, blah. And five, the purpose of the expropriation. But in all cases dealing with expropriation, we seem to go to court or we seem to go to parliament and we are only debating the market value of the property. Why are we avoiding the debate on the history of the acquisition of the property? This is a factor that's already in the Constitution, and the Constitution is saying when determining whether a farm that is worth one million rands should be um, expropriated and the owner should be compensated um, an amount of one million rands, we should determine the history of acquisition.
And the history of acquisition can actually bring the value of the compensation back to 10 rands. That is still compensation, in my opinion. Um, allow me to conclude. Where was I? <laughs> you were there, you were still standing there. You are concluding. <laughs> Um, let me just find myself. Yes, there it is. It is on this argument that I still insist that a proper audit of how land ownership was transferred from the indigenous person is conducted. Then we would, on, then we would have achieved the first step towards determining which farms or pieces of land do not require market-related compensation. Because that's the biggest hurdle that South Africa seems to face at this time. They want to expropriate land without compensation. And I'm saying the Constitution already empowers you to do so. You just need the right lawyer behind you. Um, we therefore can go ahead and propose constitutional amendments to Section 25 of the Constitution. However, the current Constitution still provides enough room and power to restore the dignity of South Africans in relation to expropriation. We should note that government machinery is now geared towards debating the constitutional amendments, but has been very slow, if not reluctant, to explore all the provisions of Section 25 and 3 of the Constitution. These sections allow expropriation without compensation because zero rand compensation is still compensation. You know, when, when you say your net worth is maybe 500 rands and you have, you also have, when, when, when your bank account has 500 rands and your debts are equal to 500 rands, what is your net worth? Yeah, you still have a net worth, ne? We don't say you don't have a net worth. You still have a net worth and your net worth is zero rands. It's still quantifiable, it's zero rands. And if in the debate on expropriation we find that the history of acquisition and the current use of the land do not justify you to be given one million rands, we should give you uh, 50 cents or, or zero rands, it's still compensation. We should not define it as non-compensation, it's still compensation. Thank you very much. Land. I actually just want to summarize uh, what's been said already, and I think it has uh, been uh, very, very interesting. Very different perspectives, sometimes uh, perspectives that are contradicting each other, uh, sometimes opinions contradicting each other. Uh, but I think it was a very interesting day. I uh, uh, think most of us have something to take away from, from here. But I think that the, the title of the conference is Justice vis a vis the Economy. Yeah. But I think the important point is maybe it's not justice vis-a-vis -vis the economy. Maybe we can have justice as well as the economy. There's no need to think that if we have justice in South Africa as far as land is concerned, that the economy will collapse as a consequence of that. I think if you've done it correctly, it could be the biggest empowerment scheme in the history of modern economies. It is quite possible that people will be thoroughly empowered by uh, land reform in South Africa. I just want to uh, 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 give some clarity before I uh, talk about the other speakers about uh, agriculture in South Africa. Remember, uh, agriculture is around about four to four and a half percent of our GDP. In other words, it's a really, really small percentage of our economy in direct terms. If we extend it into the, um, the, 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 the larger consequences of agriculture, it is, in other words, the the, the, the agro-processing, etc. It is around about 15 to even 20 percent of the South African economy. So I often argue that if I want to empower black South Africans, I will get them involved in agriculture beyond the idea of only land reform or only land, because the real value is accrued in the extended definition of, of land in South Africa. The average, if you, you probably won't believe me, but the ag average Karua farmer, somebody that farms in Karua around about uh, 5,000 hectares with around about 800 sheep, he makes, his net profit is around about 5,4% on average, which means it's not a very profitable uh, uh, enterprise as it is. It's much more worth it for that farmer to sell that land, put the money in the bank, and he will get more in terms of interest at much lower risk, for instance. So agriculture is not this massive money spinner for many, many people, as we tend to think. It's only 20% of the existing commercial farmers in South Africa that is responsible for around about 80% of the food security in South Africa. The rest are really living middle-class existence of, of the land.
two questions. The first question I refer to Dr. Marani. Uh, I to learn is a very sensitive thing, but in the manner that we approach this matter, we tend to be a a political platform to achieve a certain goal within the political space. And that issue is an issue that really keeps up emotions. I'm impressed, one of the speakers mentioned that before you can speak of a land, no hurry, before was the owner, the history of the land. Today, we try to undermine our the horses. When the horses says, I refer back to the Nguyenma Trust, when they say, we are the rightful custodians on behalf of the community, the land. Today, there's, there's a question, who have allowed you to be the custodians on behalf? That issue is an issue that weak people from the religion we think it must be really addressed with a great respect that at the time when before this matter uh, was engaged on, there were people aside for God there to leave with the horses. Let the matter be really go back to the horses where it started from. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, could I once again ask that let's shorten, let's, let's not preamble our questions. Let's just directly go to a question and indicate who do we want to answer that question. Okay, I think this one went to, oh, to the Peter Stowe. Uh, yes, sir, your question, please. If you could briefly tell us who you are, who are you representing, or just as a member of the community. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm not a politician. Yes, uh, and you're not referring to Italian food, right? Yeah, I think I was a politician. Oh, I'm a South African. And looking at the topic today, it says justice versus economy. And I was expecting us to speak of things like first things first. Because now, as, a, as South Africans, I don't see any land left at the moment. We have so many uh, people coming from our side already occupying the land. I believe, for instance, I remember back in 1985 uh, when we were fighting uh, for this, we had two organizations, the Pan Africanist Conservation and the National African uh, Congress. By that time, the stillers of the land has done us justice already because they were taking passports to go back home and leave us with what belongs to us. All right, thank you. Uh, could we briefly just address those two that have been briefly? Uh, I think the first question was for you. Oh, okay. At least you have a party. The only one that I know is when we pay you. No, thanks, Pastor Jeda. I will try to be extremely concise and respond to it. What indeed the, the, the issue of communal land and traditional leadership, I think, is a contagious issue. Uh, as I've indicated, the example of the Trust, and I believe it must and ought to be treated to the sensitivity it deserves. Uh, part of the challenges is that we should not police or bow with all due respect to the civil question as engagement around the issue of the question. They must be free engagement in this regard and allow them to express themselves, their subjects uh, must express themselves in this particular regard. I don't see why we should not be able to be in this particular discussion. We should not have limitations or confine ourselves. So that also after the process is concluded, we must be able to identify and uh, have a proper result on all of this question. There must never be a clear in there, which we do not engage on. I think that's my view. This process are also happening. Yeah, if I can also add a point uh, without being too controversial on the issue of traditional leadership. I think firstly, it's well understood that traditional leadership is always contested. There is no sort of kingship that remains uncontested. And it's contested due to two things, internal uh, cultural contestation as a result of who is supposed to ascend at a specific time. And secondly, it's contested because of the colonial history that we have. 
uh, it's contested because the British uh, principle of divide and rule had an appointment of native authorities who were not the rightful authorities, and the rightful authorities were taking places like Robben Island and Georgia together, etc. And so where we are sitting now, the lineage is not all uh, perfectly correct. So it's highly contested, and so this is why the issue of traditional leadership is such a sensitive Oh,